You are listening to Action Design, your monthly insight into the field of behavioral economics and its applications to the world around us. We bring you leading practitioners from all industries to discuss cutting-edge behavioral research and how to practically apply those concepts to the development of consumer products and public policy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Action Design Radio. Uh, I'm your co-host, Zorak Khan. With me, as always, is Eric Johnson. Hello, everyone. Wonderful to see everybody again. <laughs> and we are very excited uh, to have as our guest today, Julian Jameson, um, currently with the Embed team at the World Bank. Um, so we'll do some chatting with Julian about his background, current work, um, and behavioral applications in international development. So thank you for joining us, Julian. Of course, it's it's great to be here. Hello, hello, audience, and I'm looking forward to chatting. <laughs> Perfect. Before we dive in, Zarak, you have to share your current location. Oh man, I forgot. That. I'm, <laughs> I can't believe I almost forgot. So yeah, <laughs> if you're playing where is Zarak, uh, dot com, then if you guessed Cape Town, South Africa, then um, you win a free ride up the cable car to Table Mountain. So, That's quite the prize. <laughs> yeah, it's a great view up there if it's not cloudy. And will even if it is will cloudy, you be still joining nice. them for this ride? I don't know. I don't know if I can promise that. I'll, <laughs> I'll promise to sponsor it if you guess that correctly. You get to go to Cape Town so, and you get FaceTime with Zaraka, and that's the. <laughs> I think so far the prizes that we've given out are what flag pin, flag pin a Wiener Schnitzel, and, yeah, and those are uh, <laughs> this is a big yeah. this is a big step up from the other previous ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, so, uh, Julian, just to kind of kick things off and give our listeners um, some context, do you want to maybe just talk a little bit about kind of your background, sort of who, who you are and how you got into behavioral science? Yeah, I'll, and I'll, <laughs> it's been a bit of a winding journey. So I'll give a quick version, try to give a quick version, always, always difficult for an academic. Uh, to do that, but I will try, and then and then tell me if there are other things either now or as we go along the way that that would be interesting to to hear more about or explore a bit further or seem relevant. So, my my parents is sounds very Freudian already, but so my my parents actually both work in in uh, my father's a health economist who works internationally on in global health, and my mother's a nutritionist who's worked uh, internationally a lot uh, around the world. So I sort of come come by that part honestly. Um, I did mathematics and experimental economics, and then uh, game theory and, and decision making for my PhD. And then I was I was an academic for a while. I did um, some I did a fellowship in in global health, basically at Berkeley. And then I've been outside academia for the last gosh I don't know eight years, something like that, as a, as a behavioral economist at the Federal Reserve Bank in Boston. Although I'm a microeconomist, not not a macroeconomist, and that was that was interesting. It was nice to be there, and then at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, so the new, relatively new, U.S. government agency uh, that that deals with mortgages and payday loans and prepaid cards and checking accounts and things like that. Again, doing behavioral kind of experimental economics with a policy focus there, but I'd been continuing to do international work uh, for a lot of that time, even while at the Fed and and the Consumer Finance Bureau. And then moved two years ago to the World Bank, which was just setting up a unit to apply apply behavioral science to development policy. I think that's that's our tagline. So we're now called Embed, as you mentioned. That's mind, behavioral, and development unit. Um, we're about ten or twelve people full time, I think, and and a few more part time. So I do a lot of field experiments. I do a little bit of theoretical modeling. I do a lot of measurement and methodological issues, which is which is really kind of my main interest. I've worked mostly in sub-Saharan Africa for the international work, but somewhat other places and don't, I certainly can't claim to be an expert in that, don't really have a regional focus in that sense. And similarly, topic-wise, I've worked mostly in health and financial decision-making, but a little bit in other areas, now education. And again, can't claim to be an expert in those. I like to explore lots of different things. So it's really more the the methods and the background and the behavioral science and the evaluation side that that kind of that I really like. Cool. 
Um, and I have a question. And, um, so it sounds like you, you have a pretty like varied academic background. And as far as getting into the whole behavioral side of economics, um, was there a particular like coursework you had that was along sort of psychology, decision making, behavioral economics, or did you sort of pick it up as sort of part of uh, you know kind of as kind of your own reading or own experience in addition to kind of your formal training? Yeah, I guess good question. I would say I would say the latter, and partly because when when I got my my PhD, even that's actually almost twenty years ago now, and so there wasn't obviously that's that's after Kahneman and Tversky, so so behavioral economics and, and behavioral social science certainly existed, but it wasn't really a field certainly within economics. I don't think there were any courses at that time anywhere around the world, as as far as I know, in in behavioral economics. Um, you know, Dick Thaler, who just won the Nobel Prize, was was doing his work, and that was that was around, but it wasn't it wasn't really accepted or just wasn't that wasn't that big it wasn't even it wasn't even that people had an opinion one way or the other maybe some people didn't like it some people did but most people that just wasn't wasn't on their radar yet uh so so but i was trained in individual decision making and and i had done these lab experiments so i would see what would happen there with real human beings and i had done this theoretical work on on decision science so i found that part of it all interesting so i think it was a it was sort of a natural a natural move and i've i've always been one there are some people who do behavioral work who put that in opposition to the neoclassical, traditional, rational world. And, and I, I can see where that's coming from. And they wanted to make the point that there's not enough there, that it's not entirely working what we had before, or at least not in all situations. But I was never really part of that camp. For me, it was more, we're just adding tools to the toolbox. You know, This is just another way of thinking about it. Sometimes it's very useful, sometimes not. I still do things with money and prices and more traditional areas. So for me, it was just sort of an expansion and that felt quite natural. Then where did I learn it? That's, that was along the way. I, I spent a little bit of time in a psychology department. I you know, read papers. I did some of my own experiments, but it was, it was very much picking up around the edges. Again, I'm not sure I can claim to be an expert. I have experience now, but, but don't really have the formal training. Sure. So I think that that is kind of an interesting context with um, how you joined the World Bank, I, as I recall, because we met each other, I think, when you were still at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Yes. Yeah, I think so. And um, when, if a, correct me on the timeline here if I'm wrong, but in 2015, the World Bank put out um, the World Development Report that was focused on behavioral science, mind, body, behavior, mind, behavior, something like mind, that. Mind, society, behavior. Mind society behavior, yeah, and um, and that was sort of done in conjunction with the formation of the um, the genie was called the genie team at the time, and I guess now it's sort of morphed into the to the embed team. Um, so, you know, was that sort of also the way that you kind of talk about, you know, behavioral work as being complementary to neoclassical work? Was that sort of how the organization? And, um, you know, the, the leads of that team were kind of thinking about at, at the time of like, this is to augment the work that we're already doing, or was it supposed to sort of be like, this is kind of transformative of, uh, of what we're doing, or, or was it sort of a mix of both? Yeah, good, um, good thought. And almost makes, yeah, I'll make me a little, anyway, I'll get into that in a second. So, so you're, you're right on the timing. Uh, they, they put out, so the WDR, the World Development Report, is a flagship publication of, of the World Bank every year. Some of them have really been quite influential, some of them less so. And there's a particular topic focus. It was education most recently. Uh, and so, yeah, the 2015 report was on behavioral science and came out in, in I think it was January of anyway, early 2015. I hadn't been involved with working on it. I knew it was going on. I knew some of the people there, so I was excited to see it happen, but I hadn't been involved. And then they created this unit afterwards to, to, to put that into practice, to um, instantiate it, basically. Uh, they were thinking, what do, what do we do with all of this? You know, we've learned, we've seen this happen, we've seen that it can make, make a difference. Uh, let's create a unit. And then that's, they hired a couple of outside people, and, and I was one of those who came in at that time. Yeah. I, I think if I had to say, I think it would be, again, somewhere a little bit, I was setting up these two extremes, and of course the real world is usually somewhere in the middle. I think they're probably a little bit somewhere in the middle in the sense that 
they were thinking of it as as complementary. They certainly weren't thinking, oh, the World Bank is going to stop doing classical economics or that that was anybody's goal right. in setting this up. But, but some of them did have maybe more relative to me, maybe a little bit more of this revolutionary flair or or, or, or let's only do behavioral things. We think that's important. Even if we think it's only one, one component, which can complement, that's what we do is we do behavioral things. And I, I partly I find it very hard to, to actually define, and I can, I can try to give some examples if that's useful, but some things are pretty clearly behavioral, some things are not, but there's a very large gray area in the middle, which seemed to me just not worth any, not worth spending any time thinking about where should the line be, because I don't really care where the line is at the end of the day. But, but so I never had this sense of, oh, our goal is to do behavioral work is a little bit. Our goal is to show that these kinds of things can be useful and bring them in, but more like, you know, here's a problem. Someone comes to us with a problem and we're trying to, we're trying to solve their problem and, and we're going to take a behavioral lens. We're going to maybe do some diagnostic work, which has a little bit of that flavor. But if at the end of the day, what we think is going to solve the problem is raising a price or decreasing a price or putting a regulation in place, then, then that's fine. We'll go with that. Or if we want to compare the two, and, and we've done some some evaluations where where we'll sort of set these up against each other or or see if they work well together. So yeah, I I, I like that point of like I kind of want to dig a little bit at like taking a behavioral lens. Um, you know, you joined a, a group that um, or or you're sort of uh, as I understand it, kind of housed under like the research arm of the bank, which is obviously very kind of evidence driven already. Um, I feel like a lot of times when like Eric and I are talking with people um, about behavioral science, like the, the sort of new and interesting thing about it for their organization is that they weren't really doing evidence-based work before. So it's like, oh, the measurement piece is kind of the new angle. Um, and that's like the, one of the big value adds. Um, what was it that you guys were kind of thinking of as like your value add as you were, um, and, we'll, and we'll kind of get into sort of like how you guys, you know, actually function at, at the bank in a minute, but like as you were trying to work with other teams at the bank or do your own work, like what was it that you saw as like the value add in an already very like research and evidence focused um, kind of part of the organization? It's 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 very interesting to hear you to hear you say that about other organizations. It it makes perfect sense, but I don't think I'd ever thought about it that way. I've certainly thought in our context of how how the behavioral work has gone to some extent hand in hand with with evaluation and and even at the bank. And I'll say, although you're right, it's it's been evidence based, uh, but it's, it's it's interesting to hear that that elsewhere. And I think sometimes they get kind of confounded and and it even still bothers me. I don't know why I should care, but the, the fact that the, the earlier Nobel Prize went to uh, Danny Kahneman, sort of the behavioral, he's actually trained as a psychologist, uh, but behavioral science and behavioral economics, and to Vernon Smith, the experimental economist, and because a lot of experiments were behavioral, but actually Vernon Smith's experiments were not behavioral at all, and Kahneman did lots of empirical work in the real world that wasn't experimental, and lots of other behavioral people have done you know, administrative data or theoretical work. So there's there isn't inherently a connection between the two, but because in practice they do overlap a lot, and because I think then the Nobel Prize, at least for people who follow those things, was was given jointly, I really think it should have been two separate prizes. That that they they do end up linked, and 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 so at the bank that has happened. It's true that people were were focused on evidence and very open. It's a lot of economists, it's a lot of PhD economists, not doing research now, but on the operations side of the bank. But they have that background. They they see the value in it. But it's not really what they they don't have time to do it necessarily a monitoring and evaluation. They don't um, necessarily have resources, although that's not so much of an issue. I think it's more their incentives are not set up around that. They're just their internal career incentives, and that does matter. Uh, so so we actually did come in, and there's another group of the bank called Dime, which is Impact Evaluations. They've been around longer, quite successful, a good group that that really focuses purely on impact evaluations. But still, I think there was a lot of latent demand. Certainly for the behavioral work, uh, there have been a lot of people interested, and a lot of people not, but the bank is a huge place, so even if 10% of the people are interested, that's more than we can handle uh, for, for the behavioral science, but also for the evaluation. So, so we do, I think that is why we are in the, the research arm, at least some of us now that the joint unit is sort of mixed between two parts of the bank. Uh, my background is, is certainly as a researcher, 
I, I believe in you know in the public goods and and figuring out what we can what we can learn more broadly and and apply elsewhere. So so it has in practice been a lot of overlap. So maybe I shouldn't be so upset about about them being linked in so many people's minds. But but conceptually, there's <laughs> there's actually not a there's no particular reason they need to be. To be, okay, so here's one other purely tactical. We're a new unit. We want to show that what we do can work. How do you show right. that? Well, you do an evaluation. So even if we think there's great behavioral science to be done for systems level work, regulations, health systems, things that are much harder to do a rigorous evaluation on, we do want to do that. But we wait a few years until we've you know got some footing and we you know we do these RCTs and, and we say okay look we can prove that that we helped and then that that helps us so I think that's also just and and I suspect that's also what's going on in companies you might be able to speak to that more where they just want it's something new they want to be able to show that it works and that's the way to show it yeah and kind of building on that I guess <clears throat> even like taking a step back from there you know to, once the team's there and you've gotten some of these demonstrated results like. And it sounds like you were maybe kind of brought into the team once it was sort of formalized as becoming a thing. But how much do you know about, uh, you know, how was the case made to even build a team like this in the first place at the World Bank? Um, was there, um, a, were they particularly interested in this sort of thing? And um, just, but it, there's obviously a big difference. And, you know, we talk a lot about people who are applying this and especially within organizations like the World Bank or even private companies and governments. And there seems to be some differences in how people apply it. Sometimes people do make a team like this that actually applies it, but sometimes it's like one person doing experimental work. Sometimes they just kind of add it as a part of what people are already doing in other jobs. Like, you know, how much do you know about kind of what the thought process was and what the business, I guess business case isn't the right word, but, you know, the case for investing the time and the money and resources into this team um, and why it was built the way it was. Yeah, a, a, a little bit. Not. I certainly don't know the full story. As, as you said, I, I came in after the decision was made. I came in at the very beginning when the unit was just starting, but after all the decisions had been made. Uh, but I, I, I ta- of course, I was curious as well and, and talked to them a little bit. It, it probably was really a two-step process in that there was the decision of, of making the WDR about behavioral science. And then after that came out, there was a separate decision of, you know, should we do anything with this? And in particular, should we start a unit? What should that look like? And and the first one I don't know as much about, although in some ways it's probably the more important one of, of why focus the WDR on behavioral science. I, I would I, I don't think there were too many people explicitly in their mind at the bank doing that. So the, the two co-leaders of the WDR were uh, Carla Hoff and Varun Gori, who have both been at the bank for a while. Uh, Carla Carla has been doing some what you would call behavioral work uh, in in her career. I don't think Varun had done a lot. He was interested in, in human rights and along these lines, but he really got into it with the WDR. And there were there were certainly there are people looking at behavior change around the bank, and so things along the sort of behavioral realm for sure that that happens. But I don't think there were too many people thinking of themselves as part of this new generation, this faddish thing of behavioral economics and behavioral science applied to to policy issues or even just to to experimental science and lab science as well. Uh, so I think it was probably a little bit more that, that this was, you know, that the, obviously the UK behavioral insights team has, has got to appear somewhere. And that was 2010, I want to say. I don't know if either of you remember, but I think it was sometime around then that they formed in the in the British government. And I think that got taken seriously that they did this, and they did show a lot of successes. And so, so I think the World Bank then somebody made the case, presumably Carla and Varun, uh, with some support from the chief economist, that, that this was this was just an area we should know more about at the bank, and this is an area that might be even more relevant for developing countries and the global south. Uh, but it's certainly something they should look into. So I think that was probably the big decision. And then after the report came out, my sense was it was like, oh, well, this is great. What do we do with it? I guess we should have a few people like doing this work around the bank. And it was a very small team at the beginning. And, and we sort of grown from them by being able to show demand. I don't know if that sort of fully gets at it or not. Yeah, definitely. No, I think uh, the this is great. Now, what do we do with it? Is uh, kind of the common question people uh, <laughs> tend to. I think organizations <laughs> run into is like, oh, this is super interesting, and we should be doing this, but how? <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah. I mean, that's kind of one method, and it's great that the World Bank sort of dove right into it. 
Um, so we've gotten a lot into sort of the background and you know, a little bit of what you've done. I think it'd be interesting to kind of shift and talk a little bit more about some of the specific projects you've worked on. Um, if there's any kind of particular, um, I mean, when I was looking through kind of the list of work that the team does and you yourself, um, it was overwhelming and how interesting it all sounded. So um, I, or rather than pick out a few, is there any, yeah, I'd be interested to hear if there's, you know, uh, one or two or a few particular projects or maybe just focus areas that you're kind of most interested in how you're kind of applying behavioral science, any interesting findings you've had. Yeah, well, I, I'm biased. Obviously, I find it all pretty interesting as well. And that's 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 why I'm working on it. It was <laughs> just a quick story. When I was at the Boston Fed, the administrative support staff, because they would sort of see our travel requests and and sometimes little internal proposals and things. So they would say to me, everybody else's work is so boring here, but you do really cool stuff. And I was like, yes, actually. I, no, it's not all boring, but yes, I do really cool stuff. And it's, and, and it's, it's been a lot of fun. So, uh, well, so, so here's one, and, and this is, uh, well, yeah, we'll see. I think it's a good example. It's not necessarily even the one that I'm most excited about right now. I'm happy to talk about those, but I think it's a nice example of, of some of the work and how it can play out and some of the complexities as well. So, so one of the things that governments are very into is tax compliance. Obviously, they like people to pay their taxes. They get more revenue that way. And that was one of the early successes for the UK Behavioral Insights team was changing these letters that went out to delinquent taxpayers. And they would just put in a few sentences, especially around social norms was one that got a lot of attention, just telling people that 90 some percent i forget the number now 96 percent of of citizens pay their taxes on time that was enough to get people to pay their taxes and so this is a nice example of sort of behavioral science people just care about what others are doing even if it's not going to be public for themselves it just it seems to matter to them and that's that's a theme that comes up so so the world bank before this our new team was created actually tried something similar in guatemala and Guatemala is unusual in the world for having one of the lowest ratios of tax revenue to GDP of any country in the world. Obviously, there are poorer countries, but the ratio of income to, to the economy size is very small. And the equivalent number there for percentage of people paying their taxes on time is like 65%. Again, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but, but somewhere around there. So there was this question, if we send out a letter telling people 65% of people pay their taxes on time, is that going to help? Is that going to hurt? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And it, so they tried it, and they did a you know, randomized evaluation, and it turns out it helped. More people paid when they heard that. And so the, the interpretation was that expectations were lower, that they actually thought, oh, nobody pays their taxes in Guatemala. And to find out that two-thirds of people pay their taxes, it was like, oh, wow, people are actually paying their taxes. And it, it moved things. It didn't, you know, it didn't change overnight to 90%. But it moves up by a couple of percentage points, and that's a big deal. That's a lot of money if you can, can do this cheaply with a letter. So we started working with the Polish government. and we, we had lots of ideas for this is a little in the background of how these projects work, which is why maybe also it's a nice example. So it's great to get to work with the government because things are actually happening, because the scale is large. It's going to go out to hundreds of thousands or millions of people. We had lots of ideas for different treatments we could try. We wanted to replicate the, the social norms uh, and some other things that have been done before, but obviously try some new things as well. So we learned from that. I think we presented them with a list of 12 or so. They shot down three or four of them and said, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're not trying that. Okay, you know, that's how the government works. But the others, they were willing to let us try. Uh, went back and forth. And we found some positive results, but social norms actually had a negative effect. So um, the, we had, we'd, we'd improved the letter just to make it more readable and legible and clear because all of these things are written in legalese and that's, that's a problem to begin with. So all of the treatments relative to the control, the status quo, did better. But, but we had this sort of basic, what I would call a behavioral letter, which did, did fine, which improved. Relative to that, then when we added these sentences about different different tweaks, different you know behavioral theories, relative to that, the social norms actually actually went down. So the the compliance went down when they were told who else had had paid. So something different is going on in Poland, and that's that's nice in a way because then we learn it's not that people don't care about each other in Poland, but there's something different happening, and the context matters. And that's one of the things we keep saying as behavioral scientists is let's go in and do diagnostics. 
the general theories are true. Humans care about what other humans think. Humans care about intrinsic rewards. Humans have, you know, they don't care as much about the future as they should. These sort of behavioral elements, those are universal. But how they play out in a given context, which other humans they care about, is it your peers, is it your elders, is it your community members, is it other people in the country, that varies from culture to culture. And that's something you just have to go in and look at. There's no, there's no theory for that. There's no other way. So, so we had this, to us, very interesting result that it, that it went down. And we had some other, fortunately, we had some other treatments as well where, where it went up and, and it improved more. But that, so that's a typical example of both sort of working with the government, finding some interesting results, something new, proving this point about, about context matters, and, and being able to, to show a success at the end of the day. So when you're thinking about, like, the context of a project, which, I mean, I remember that was a very prominent theme of the WDR, um, as it is just obviously in behavioral science in general, is the context for a project that you're working on typically dictated for you by either the government that you're working with or the, you know, the group that you're working with, or are you able to kind of define it yourself? I guess a bit of both, probably, probably more the former. So often it will be, we work sometimes directly with governments, uh, but we work mostly with World Bank operational teams who are then working with governments, often making a loan to governments because that's what the World Bank does, but, but not always. So, so yes, it'll be the team that that comes to us or is connected with us one way or another, and then and then that context, which usually means both the location and often the the population of interest. Is it? I was just on a call earlier this morning with uh, working with entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs in a particular region in Pakistan, because there's a World Bank project going on there, and we're we're adding on to that. Now that being said. We can pick and choose a little bit. There is there is enough demand right now, or we can go out and try to drum up business internally at the bank, basically, and so go to the education people and say we'd really lo- like to work on education. We think there's some some natural overlap there in particular areas or another. Uh, and then sometimes there. Are, so so one project, we had an idea for something we wanted to do, and we went looking around for what's what's the an appropriate context and we weren't even necessarily going to do that in the context of a world bank project it turns out we did find a world bank project in in an area we wanted to work this is um, increasing uptake of modern contraception among adolescent girls and we ended up working in cameroon which was one of the countries we'd been considering and then it turned out there was a world bank project going on there that we could sort of latch on to and take advantage of but we would have gone forward even if there hadn't been that project so so some of them were we know there's a particular setting that makes the most sense to work in. And then we still have to do the diagnostics there, go and find out exactly what's happening, but we'll have some parameters that that we can start with. And do you guys ever have an idea of like, oh, this is something like a concept that we would like to test out, but either, you know, there isn't like an external facing project that we can sort of persuade to, you know, let us tag along, um, or it just makes more sense to, I feel like I remember in the WDR, part of it was talking about, part of it talked about, you know, applying behavioral science to the actual like, business processes of the bank itself. Um, and, you know, I, I, I was, I, I, my impression was that most of the work that you guys were doing was sort of externally facing. I, I was curious if you guys ended up, if you've done any sort of internal work, um, or if, it, if that's something that you guys do, if you can't find like a good external partner, um, and and if so, you know what what you kind of found there. We have we have tried to do that, and I think and nothing's quite gotten off the ground yet. But I think it I think it will, and and we would certainly like to do some of these internal projects. It's probably not as it sounds better the way you put it of like oh we're. We want to test something, and if we can't find the right way to do it externally, we'll we'll you know we'll find the right place, and that might be internal. It's probably a little bit more been that you know we think it matters. Everybody looks at their local environment and say, oh, this is frustrating, or why aren't they doing that? And you know maybe we can come in and change this, and that's fine. And it's probably a little bit, and I would say tactical in the sense that you know we want to we want to show both to the management at the bank that this is relevant here, but also. When we go, because we say and we believe, I fully, 100% believe that this is not this is not biases of poor people that we're talking about. This is biases, if you want to call them that, 
some of them are, some of them aren't, biases of human beings. And it applies mm -hmm. to policymakers around the world. And so we sometimes want to intervene at the level not just of consumers or clients or patients, but also at civil servants and maybe also at the level of policymakers. And, and it applies to us as, as development professionals. And, and so we want to be able to show that almost externally. So part of it is really to be able to say, look, we're doing this to ourselves. To ourselves, that sounds bad. We're, we're figuring things out with ourselves and, and there's ways to improve. Uh, but then there are particular things we've looked at. There's an agile pilots project at the bank. We've talked to human resources about hiring practices and, and how to reduce discrimination, implicit discrimination and hiring at the bank. I've just been in conversations about uh, some some uh, some people put together a database of impact evaluations, and they want to see can we get policymakers uh, at the country level around the world, but also, for instance, World Bank staff to use the data that's out there, the research that exists. So we might actually randomize that and make this encourage some of them to have access to this database and use it, and others not. So so we would very much like to do that, but but uh, it hasn't been a large part of our portfolio, and and nothing's really gotten started so far. Yeah, I definitely understand like the from a tactical angle, especially like I think from the the organizations that I've spoken with about this, you know, a lot of them are different stages of um, kind of implementing this stuff with their within their own groups and have different levels of, you know, senior support or buy in at an organizational level. Obviously, you guys had the WDR, which was sort of a big um, kind of shot in the arm for it at the bank. Um but it still kind of seems to remain like a little bit of a blind spot in terms of, you know, there's, um, you know, if we're saying, yeah, like, as you said, like, these things are universal, these biases are universal, like, there's obviously plenty of application within, you know, our organization to how we kind of do our own decision making as well. Um, and, um, yeah, it seems like sometimes you kind of know how, like, like a tech company has like a terrible internal website or something like <laughs> like that like uh -huh. we like you know we're like espousing these ideas and like yeah we help other people do all these things but our own internal stuff like could benefit from it uh as well so partly i was asking to see if you guys had any sort of results from that side and then partly i was also curious just about how you guys go about kind of choosing the projects that you work on because uh as eric mentioned you know there's you know and, and i would encourage everyone to to check out your guys' webpage on the on the bank uh, site because there's so much interesting work that's there. Um, you know, it, I was guessing that it was like a mix of your own ideas versus you know people maybe coming to you with with stuff. But I was curious as to how you guys make decisions with the limited resources that you have of, as to what to pursue. Yeah, it's really it's it's been a mix. I can I can certainly say a little bit more about it because it's something we're we're thinking hard about and figure out. Uh, trying to figure out what to do. We're not really in a steady state yet or, or equilibrium. So we're trying to explore a little bit and figure out what's what's the best process. And I'm sure it's not it's never going to end up being a, a single approach, but even what's the right mix. And so sometimes it's been, so some people, for instance, knew, knew my work or, or knew me personally, but knew some of the research that I'd done before I joined the bank. So sometimes it would be somebody from a project team coming to, reaching out to me specifically saying, oh, we were thinking of something along these lines. We saw that you'd done something like that before. What do you think? Would you like to work on it with us? Do you think it's applicable here? Or here's we're facing a problem, even if we don't have an idea for a solution that looks like something that, that you've you've dealt with before. And I'm sure that some of that goes on with with at least some of the other kind of more senior members of the team. Sometimes it's we'll set up a workshop. Uh, for for bank teams to come and sort of tell them a little bit about behavioral science. And that's both really is supposed to be internal capacity building, which is important to us and which is part of our job. Uh, but also it's a little bit, you know, is there a potential for collaboration or, or partnership? So they'll come in for a day or two. They'll see examples of how this has played out. They can go back and, and proselytize a little bit or at least sort of know, brainstorm ideas. Uh, and then maybe we start working with them. Sometimes it's been, there's a particular area where we'll look at our portfolio and say, oh, we're not doing much in health. And we think health is is both an important topic, but also something where behavioral science could be quite relevant. Let's reach out to the sort of middle or more senior level people in health above the sort of 
let's call it task teams, the specific project level at the bank, and see you know see what they think, see if we can convince them, see if they have ideas for for projects that they know are going on in their in their area where this might be relevant. Uh, and sometimes it's people coming to one of our events. You know, there'll be a lecture or a guest lecture, a launch event, or you know, a book talk, something like that. And they'll they'll hear about our team, and we won't we won't have known who they were before at all. And and they'll just reach out and say, oh, we have this good idea. Um, one actually, there was a, another tax project in in Latvia that we worked on, and I I saw something on the bank homepage that they were doing tax work in Latvia, and I reached out to them and said, what, you know, what do you think about it? about a behavioral angle but now we're we're trying to be a little more mature at the beginning we were just sort of we were trying to make sure there was enough demand because we really didn't know which way it would go and so we we're starting lots of things so that we could work and that was that was great now we're trying to figure out what should that process be and and frankly we're trying to think about funding as well because there's a, a sort of a whole internal bank process around that but but we do have to some extent uh, fund ourselves even if that's all internal show that there's demand for our work and and so it, it does end up being a little bit about you know do they have resources for this uh, if we work with governments uh, if it's if it's you know in sub-saharan africa then other than south africa where you are i guess they, they have money but most of sub-saharan africa you know we we wouldn't certainly wouldn't be charging a government for our services, but middle-income countries that that is part of what the bank does. It's actually we act like a consultant sometimes, and and uh, governments will sometimes pay us for for things. So in the in the Middle East or, or in some other areas, so it's a mix. So, and so kind of building on that, um, so that's kind of how you select the projects. But I was kind of curious about the kind of mechanics of how you actually develop and then kind of execute these bigger, you know, especially these kind of field experiments. So, I mean, I run experiments as part of my job, but I have the benefit of being pretty much all digital. So it's pretty easy in a lot of ways or a lot easier in, you know, a digital environment to just <clears throat> run tests on emails, landing pages, stuff like that. But, you know, you're working in kind of the physical world and in a lot of um, kind of difficult areas, you know, in developing countries and uh, things like that where, um, you know, there's, there's obviously a lot more work and barriers. So I was curious, and, and you would also mention we were emailing, talking a little bit about kind of the history of RCTs a little bit. So, um, so I was wondering if we could have a little bit of a, an RCT portion, if you want to kind of um, give a little bit of background for some people who aren't experienced, you know, on what exactly you define an RCT as, like maybe a little bit of what, uh, you know, your history learning it and what the general history is, and then how you apply that to such meaty problems is what you guys work on yeah happy to and and i yeah I, I do have a working paper on the on the history of rcts which should be which is out there out there somewhere if anyone's if anyone's interested trying oh. to publish that but it's a it's a weird it's an unusual topic and so i'm trying to find the right right outlet but there is a there's a public working paper it was it was fun it came from a blog post i did i so i read something in a magazine about uh, a, a clinician a, a belgian doctor from 17th century who who wrote he didn't he didn't do this but he wrote this perfect description of an rct because he it was like the relative benefits of bloodletting versus some other crazy crazy thing this is like it really makes you worry when you look at the history of medicine and so so <laughs> and he said what we should do is we should take 500 sick people from the hospital and draw lots and half of them will will follow what what you guys think is best, the uh, medical establishment of the time, and half of them will follow what I say, and we'll basically see how many die. We'll see how many end up in the graveyard at the end, and, and that's how we'll decide who's right. So it was, and they didn't, as far as anybody can tell, they didn't, they didn't do this. But the idea was was there. So you know that was, and that's really very close to. We we don't usually use death as an outcome, but obviously in in, in medicine they they do sometimes. And but that idea of let's let's randomize so that. Uh, so that the two groups are comparable and so that we can really isolate the effect of, of the difference that we control between the two of them was out there. Uh, now, it didn't, the first one I could find mention of was actually also about uh, homeopathy. This was in, I think, 1835 and in Germany where they were, yeah, it was, it, anyway, they were looking at like water and like different kind of salts in the water and see whether that would help. And they did, but then again, nothing happened. Uh, some some psychophysics at the end of the 19th century. So this is like weights and perception. Can people feel different amounts uh, and uh, different temperatures and, and different pressures? They did a little bit of randomization there. 
but it really it really wasn't until the 1920s late 1920s and what was interesting then is you had three or four different areas all at once coming together so the first really clinical medical trials people associate it was like from 1940s so i think streptomycin or something this is the one that a lot of people think of as the first rct but it but it wasn't it hadn't going around before then but it really it took off at that point but so you have in the late 1920s you have it in medicine you have agriculture so this is again a lot of people know this one fisher the great statistician was working um in an agriculture station in england and so he randomized plots of land and tried different things you know fertilizer and different seeds to see what worked best which was nice and he developed a lot of the statistics around that uh, but then you also had in educational psychology, people have been thinking of this, and there's a long technical background in educational psychology, how, basically how to teach kids, you know, how do kids learn best, and, and a lot of randomization there, and textbooks and class size and all kinds of different things. And then the one that was really fun was in political science. So this guy in the 1924 presidential election in Chicago, and it's not 100% clear whether he randomized, I was just having this debate with somebody, but I, th I think the circumstantial evidence is that he did that he, he divided up the wards into like 12 areas in Chicago and he sent out postcards to encourage turnout. And he was thinking about what language to send it in because there were a lot of Polish people there. And it looks like a modern, a modern experiment, a modern field experiment. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of extraordinary what's going on. But then it didn't take off and sort of sat around for a while. And then you have a resurgence. Medicine comes in the 40s and 50s and it's been completely standard there ever since. Uh, and then, and then, sort of for economics and social science, it wasn't really until the '60s or even the '70s that it that took off. And then we have the more recent randomista movement, where it's been really popular, but which is a whole whole separate thing. But I would say, really, as of the '70s, people started doing this and thinking about that you can apply it to to areas like social policy, to children's development, um, public health, rather than rather than just clinical health. And and there are some early ones where they're Actually, like subsidizing contraception, actually, and, and and family planning of various types, and just you, we think of this as as fairly recent because it's become so popular and, and been in the news. But but there were people doing it, and it was it was known for a while. Um, then there's the whole there's the diagnostic stage. There's there's the sort of what you're getting into about about how our field experiments different from some of the ones that are either in a lab or or of course online nowadays and. The ideal version, we go out and, and do a whole early stage of diagnostics and pilot testing and trying things out. And some of the some of the projects we're able to do that. We have both the time and, and the money. Some of them we don't, and then that some becomes kind of desk research at that point and calling people up and, and talking to them and making a little bit of a best guess and then setting up the, the design for the evaluation. Outcome measures also. Sometimes it's administrative data. Sometimes it's going doing a survey. Sometimes it's observational. Sometimes now we're doing you know cell phone data and satellite data and these kinds of other interesting interesting new things. And I, the more the better, but depends on on what's relevant for that project and and uh, what kind of money we have. And how do you feel that it's different, you know, to or do you think that it's different in any way to like the way that you were working on things for like. CFPB or in some of the other projects that, that you've been on, um, you know, is it, is the international context, does that change the way that you kind of go about the approach or is the methodology the same? I think I think the biggest difference is is working with governments, and it's funny to say because it was at the CFPB, I was I was in the government, but but we didn't do. I was pushing them, of course, for this, but it was hard. I understand we didn't do a lot of experiments with the you know policy levers at the CFPB, but we did work with private. We did some lab experiments, and we worked with. So, for instance, we worked with American Express. This one, this one's public on on encouraging savings on a prepaid card. But that was the kind of thing, maybe it was easier to make that connection because I was at the Consumer Finance Bureau, but the kind of thing that academics do and that, that I've done in my sort of previous academic research or life, and, and that's some of what we're doing now at, at the World Bank, uh, working with academics sometimes, or we'll go and work with an NGO or, or a private sector firm. We did something in Tanzania with one of the mobile operators there. But most of what we're doing is working with governments. And so to, to me, I think that's the bigger difference. Then the methodology is, is fairly similar, what we're trying to do. And, and some, in some ways in the financial sector, which is where I've worked the most, kind of both in the U.S. and internationally, there's some things that are 
obviously a lot of things that are more advanced in in the U.S., but there are some things like mobile money, which is more advanced outside the U.S., and so there's there's learning that goes in both directions there. So it's really more than operationally, I would say it's the working with governments and both the opportunities and and the limitations and frustrations that come with that, which is which is the biggest difference of of being at the bank. There's a lot of there's a lot of other international work one could do, and that I'd been doing before, which is which is really not not as different. Um, and do you feel that there are like more cons- constraints? And I mean, I, and I think this is maybe kind of similar to Eric's question, but like. I would imagine that there are obviously more constraints on like what you guys can can do in terms of um, you know if we're sending out an email um, you know or changing like the landing page or something like that like you know that's something that you can tweak and iterate a thousand times and show you know relatively easily to a bunch of different people. Do you feel like the stakes are kind of higher for the work that you do in the sense that like there's maybe like a longer period for to actually run the experiment so there's less ability to kind of iterate and and tweak things or is it just sort of you know does that does that change your your measures of success at all yeah we it's a it's a it's a good thought and we think about that and and would would like to try to be a little bit faster, a little bit more nimble, and, and in some cases we can be, and I think we're pushing on that. I, I think you're right that it tends to be both the kinds of interventions, the settings, and the kinds of outcomes that we're interested in just just make it a, a bit harder, and I'm, I'm jealous sometimes of, of those of you who can work in this sort of faster environment and try a bunch of things. And so it's partly the implementation. Yes, sometimes we want to do this sort of diagnostic stage, and that takes several months, and sometimes the intervention itself is a training program and that takes a couple of months but a lot of it i think is more about what are what are we trying to measure what's the outcome so so think of savings do we care about savings right when the whatever the intervention is or the program and it could be you know a, a monetary bonus it could be financial education course you know our access to to mobile money whatever all kinds of different things you could try is it savings in the next month is it savings in the next 30 years? Is it some downstream effect from savings that if we think they save more then their financial well-being will be higher, they'll have less debt three years later? What is it that we care about? And a lot of those things, we can get a proxy kind of quickly. Of, did it change their knowledge or better yet, their behavior? And that matters. That means we something happened. You know, We had an impact. And, and sometimes we know from other data or just from common sense and theoretical models that that's likely to have to have the more medium term or, or downstream in, impact we want, but sometimes we we don't know that or or we're not sure, and then and then we have to wait. So I think it's it's a lot about if the outcome we're interested in is something that's a year or two years later, then obviously it's just it's harder to be nimble. That what we can try instead, and and maybe one advantage of working with governments, although this would also be true for a large corporation, is that if the sample size is big enough, we can instead of doing kind of A B testing. We can do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J testing with ten treatment arms, you know, and then, and then that gives us a little bit more to work with and different variants. Put two things together, uh, or change the intensity, you know, so it's three different versions of of how much, you know, how much financial literacy training they're getting or or whatever it is. So we have to do a little bit more of that up front, uh, but then sometimes we can we can still learn quite a bit afterwards. Um, so kind of build on this, and um, you know, I. One of the areas, and so we kind of talked a little bit earlier about kind of how, you know, in, in a way you're sort of self-taught in some of the behavioral side of things. Um, but you've obviously got a lot of academic training in, it seems like, the, the experimental side. And what I've kind of noticed is I think a lot of people can learn a lot of the basics of kind of the behavioral theory through kind of self-education and reading the Hallmark books. And of course, you know, the deeper they go, the better. But it seems to me like there's a little bit of a limit, uh, like it's kind of limited resources on really good experimental training. Um, how would you recommend somebody who wants to start running experiments and, you know, randomized control trials? Um, you know, is there anything that you think uh, outside of, uh, you know, a PhD program that, um, you know, you found, especially in kind of your research about the history of it and stuff, um, uh, you know, how would you recommend people go about learning this stuff or at least get started doing that? So first, I, I think I think you're right. I would I would agree that obviously it's it's fun to read a lot of this behavioral stuff, and and people should do some of that, and that's a very useful background. 
but that it only takes you so far and that's that's partly just the nature of the field is is still at a point where there isn't there may never be a sort of single unifying theory that that you learn that and you understand it there's just lots of different bits and pieces and they're moving along and so so having some of the specific knowledge is important to know what a social norm is and i would say things like time inconsistency uh but but it's it, that's not at the end of the day, that's not what's going to going to get you all the way there, and and it's it's almost as much having a feel for these things exist and are out there and can matter rather than knowing topic by topic what what they all are. And I was just just discussing this with someone recently internally who's trying to sort of uh, boost her background and, and all of that. So I, I think you're right. It's 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 having then the experimental, the sort of technical side, and you can get some of that from from you know if you obviously none of these things are trivial. There's a time cost, but interning or uh, volunteering or, or working as a, as a research assistant or a research analyst for someone. Some of it you can do now. I, I ran my first Mechanical Turk experiment recently just because I was curious about something something small. And, you know, that you can you can go and do it. You can get a few hundred people as a, a sample size uh, for you know, very little money. So just pay out of pocket, frankly, if you, if you, if you need to. And then, then you learn about different sample sizes you learn a little bit of the statistical analysis you'll make mistakes because you'll you'll realize you ask some questions and they came back with answers you weren't expecting and so you can't really interpret it the way you wanted and you'll do better the next time and and those kinds of things help and also just being able to say you know obviously for me it's a bit different because i can go in and talk to a government and they'll say oh we don't like to randomize because that's not fair and i can give them the history of rcts and i can tell them about the 10 previous projects i've been on where some government or some firm didn't want to randomize and how we, you know, made everybody happy and it all worked out. And so it helps me to be able to say that. But if you've even read a little bit about that or done it once or twice yourself and have an idea for different ways to do it, then that it gets you part way part way along. And and certainly for field experiment kinds of things, the talking to people, figuring out, keeping everyone happy legitimately and there almost always is this area of overlap where their business concerns or if the government the policy concerns are satisfied and from my perspective the research concerns and the rigor is satisfied as well and just being a little bit creative to find the way so the more times you've seen different instances of that whether it's from reading papers or talking to people or being on projects yourself the easier it is to to come up with something in the future yeah that's a really good point that's something i was just talking to somebody about uh, yesterday is that Experiments can seem like this sort of very rigid mathematical process, but it's actually a very creative process um, it is. most of the time. Uh, you know, there's kind of those key parts of it you need to hit, but it's it's never as simple in, in real life. Um, even working in like digital environments, it's usually never as simple as just, oh, we're going to do this thing, we'll throw it on there. Like you usually have to kind of think of interesting proxies for the behavior you want to do or like, you know, interesting ways to test it um, or just different interventions. Like it is a very creative process. And especially when you get multiple stakeholders involved and it's kind of satisfying all those different areas um it's a lot more of a yeah it's a lot more of a creative process and i think people realize that's a good way of putting it i, I, I certainly agree we had we had one where we were working when i was at the cfpb we were working with a, a credit union in the u.s and you know we wanted to see take up of a particular loan product they had and so of course we want to randomize among people who are interested in the loan we wanted to randomize some people to get the loan and some people not to so we can see what's the effect of the loan and of course they don't want to have like some customer of theirs who comes and says they've advertised a loan the customer says oh i want this loan and then they say nope sorry no loan for you go away uh which i understand and we wouldn't we wouldn't pursue that so we came up with like a, an encouragement discouragement design where some people are more encouraged it's easier for them to take out the loan other people are. nobody's denied it so basically the take up in our treatment group is not a hundred percent but it's fairly high the take up in the equivalent of the control group is not zero because some people are still getting the loan but as long as we get this exogenous variation between the two and as long as the sample size is large enough then statistically that's perfectly fine for us and that and that made them happy so yes exactly coming up with those kinds of things and and it's going to be a little bit different in each context depending on what their constraints are and what our constraints are and, and just the mechanics of, of how, how it's being implemented. Sure. Have there been any of these that um, you've seen like in the field and thought, oh man, this is something I should uh, try myself and that you've applied in your own, in your own life? Or I guess a flip side of that is, is there any, you know, bias that you see like regularly that you're like, oh man, I hadn't thought about this before, but now that I know about it, I, 
see this all the time in my own behavior. I guess the, I, there are some, and I went, one of our, our early workshops was actually Dan Ariely, the well-known behavioral economist, a great creative guy, came in. Uh, it was nice. He's been a, a fan of our work, which is very nice, and a supporter. So he came in and helped do one of these workshops for World Bank Team. So I was going through it as as kind of a co-facilitator to work with small groups when it split out. But but I was listening as well, and thinking, what what can I get out of it? And and there were some there of really – so one, one which I, I've tried to do, and I only sometimes succeed, but every time I hear about it, I, I, I want to do more, is just writing things down, like writing out a plan – Writing out a few steps and and some of some of the experiments are just I love these where where they'll be like here's your lo you're trying to get people vaccinated and you tell them on a map like here's the local clinic and here's when they're open and this is usually not an information treatment like, these people and we've and they've tested this like they know where the local clinic is but you just give them this little map on a postcard and tell them and the when it's open is not surprising either it's like business hour like it's open during business hours but they're more likely to go or or in the tax compliance you write out a list you say like here's the three steps to doing your taxes first get all your stuff together then fill out the form then send it in you know there's no there's no information <laughs> content here it's like we're not we're not teaching you anything you didn't know we're not making it easier it's just like having the list and 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 it's been shown for people as well to write out there's actually a nice one with with job applicants like I am going to apply for, you know, this many jobs this week, two jobs this week, or I'm going to send in four resumes this week. And, and having people write that out, having people make a plan, and real, it doesn't even have to be an ambitious plan, just something realistic, but make it concrete, make it as specific as possible and write it down, like physically write it down. And the, it just, it really does make a difference and it's low cost. And so I, I do that sometimes, but, but I should be doing it more. So maybe uh, That's a good one. one. Building on that a little bit, um, shifting, we, we've been pretty deep in the weeds of like the you know the execution of experiments and kind of the, the practical sense. So maybe we can do a quick shift to close out a little, or getting towards closing out and more of the theoretical part. Um, so you said some like good examples of some kind of common things you tend to see with like you know the kind of planning and giving out directions. But um, and I really liked your comment earlier about how you mentioned that you know the the kind of biases aren't really any different for people in like a poor developing country than they are anywhere else, but just in the different contexts, different things come out. So in your in your work, I mean, is there any kind of particular um, kind of behavioral biases or concepts that you tend to see more common in the type of, you know, you work in a lot of kind of developing countries, like in, in those kind of areas that tend to kind of affect people's behavior more? And, um, uh, you know, what type of things tend to come up? And obviously it's always uh, um, kind of contextual because, you know, an example is I know like scarcity is a big one and that, you know, whenever people are in kind of a, a scarcity mindset, we our decision making is affected, and obviously that tends to affect poor people disproportionately because they have a lot more scarce resources. Um, so, any other examples like that that uh, you kind of tend to see more and more, and that you know could maybe help people kind of understand um, how what people are dealing with and what the you know what kind of psychological biases people are kind of combating in a lot of these areas you're working. Yeah, well, one I've I've thought a lot about or just been interested in and, and done some work in is, is time preferences and discount rates and, and things like that, both actually at a sort of theoretical conceptual level of discounting and non-constant rate discounting or non-exponential discounting, which comes up in policy a lot for things like environment and climate change and long-term health outcomes, but also very much at an individual decision-making level. And it relates to scarcity. Scarcity is interesting. I like I like the theory. I think it's, I think it's important. It, it's sort of it's sort of a theory of why things go wrong, but it doesn't always tell you what goes wrong. And and so I think both sides are important. It's I think of it a little bit more on the input side rather than the output side. And again, very important to look at. But but in terms of an example, and so this could come from from what's driving the the scarcity idea or from somewhere else, is this idea of either time inconsistency, which is when I. I trade off two points in the future. Right now, I think of them as sort of the same. They're both in the future. It's a year from now and a year and six months from now. It kind of all looks the same from, from the present perspective. But when it gets to be a year from now, those are now, one of them is the present at that point, and the other one is six months away. And so, so I start treating them very asymmetrically at that point. So that's the time and consistency. But even just high discount rates, just not putting a lot of weight on the future, whether inconsistent or not. And this is going back to the beginning of the discussion where... So time and consistency is considered behavioral. Exponential discounting is is part of the neo, neoclassical model, but you know 
some ways it doesn't really matter. Sometimes they both have the same application or they're both coming from, from the same place or it's hard to distinguish empirically and I just don't think it matters too much. So that's one that does come up a lot because people are very focused on, on getting by right now. And, and if, you're, if you're poor and if you're in a developing country, you're thinking about how, how to get food. And of course, this is true for poor people in the U.S. as well. You know, how to get food over the next week, how to, how to secure housing, how to, how to pay the rent. And so you're not thinking medium term or long term. You're not necessarily taking advantage of good investment opportunities. There, there was uh, an example of people who were renting wheelbarrows to sort of buy and sell. That's a, a common way you get, you know, you're selling sneakers on the street and in, in some some capital city somewhere. And so you have a wheelbarrow for for moving around. But a wheelbarrow is a little bit of a fixed cost if you don't have any money. So they would rent them uh, from from the people. And it turns out they could, if they if they were able to save just a little bit over the course of six months they could buy a used wheelbarrow and then that would reduce their operating costs and then for, you know for the rest of their life after that this is you know it's not going to grow their business and they're going to be a you know a great entrepreneur but their life is going to be a lot easier they're going to have more cash at the end of the day every day and nobody was doing this and and it's because they're probably very just very focused on the present or they don't have a way to save but this this idea of thinking about right now in the next couple of days rather than the future is a so scarcity would say that's maybe quite a rational response to the environment you're in, and I think that's right. But again, it doesn't whether it's rational or not, it doesn't change the outcome that people are very focused and that if we could just break them out of that in different ways and, and for different for different uh, environments, we, we might really be able to make a difference. So so that's one that, that just really comes up a lot and that I think and again comes up for other people certainly as well. Most of us are maybe not saving enough, although I have some um, some internal debates about that, but certainly, certainly not not putting a lot of weight in the future. Sometimes, I think we can all relate to that one <laughs> in some some yes. fashion. But it was, but it's why it, it certainly and it, it. So yes, as an example of they are mm -hmm. universal, but they play out differently, and some are accentuated in in those environments. And this is mm -hmm. one of the ones that I would say probably probably really is. It was. I remember asking. This was early on. We had these survey questions of asking people where do the where do you put yourself on a scale uh, like socioeconomic status in your local community like a 10 point ladder is a ladder with 10 rungs where would you place yourself this is actually turns out to be quite predictive of health outcomes quite quite a good way of of rather than just trying to collect all that data yourself and put it together people are really good at doing this but then we asked where where do you see yourself in 5 years where do you think you'll be as a prediction where would you like to be in terms of aspirations we thought that was interesting that might respond to treatments and some of the things I've worked, this was like the most bizarre question they had ever heard. Like thinking of themselves and like, where do I want to be in five years was not something that had ever crossed their mind as far as I could tell. And, and just something they had diff difficulty conceptualizing. Whereas something we hear about so much here was from the time we're kids, like you should be thinking about where you're going. It's a very normal thing. And, and for them, it just wasn't. And, and in some ways, that's reasonable. In some ways, I think if they were forced to do that a little bit more, it, it might make a big difference. Did you end up flexing that time period in the question to see like what the amount of time was where people, the majority of people, were kind of like, "Oh yeah, that's the normal question to respond to." Yeah, that we didn't, we didn't there. That's a very good question. I, I, I would guess here, this was in actually in Vanuatu in the in the South Pacific. Uh, I, I would guess it would have to have been fairly short for it to be something that they were used to thinking about. Yeah, to be something where it was normal conceptually, where they could they could imagine that maybe maybe a bit longer, but even even a year, I would say, was probably pushing it for that. So, um, you mentioned a few minutes ago, like sort of the state of the field and how you know it's kind of constantly evolving, and you know, there's I always either read articles or hear people kind of talking about either in a hopeful or in a kind of despondent way, like looking for some kind of, um, you know, uh, you, as you said, like unified theory or unified model. Um, and while that may not be like immediately apparent or on the horizon, like are there things that, that you are particularly excited about or that you think of as, um, you know, sort of like the next step or the next evolution in the field? Yeah, good, 
Big question. Yeah. I, I, oh, yeah. Well, so we're well, getting close to wrap up time. So yeah. No, that the would be big question. Probably, I should, I should <laughs> probably probably go soon as as well myself. But yeah. So maybe a couple of thoughts on it. One is that I'll give a lot of credit to the to the WDR, and they're not the only ones. And said I wasn't I wasn't involved with it, so I can say they did they did a good job from from outside. But to put so the title was Mind, Society, and Behavior, and they they very explicitly from from what I heard put society in in the title and even even before behavior. So there was this sense of behavioral economics being basically economics and psychology. It's these biases and heuristics of individual decision making. And that's important. And that is a big part of it. But then there's this whole social element that, that brings in anthropology and sociology and, and the peer effects on the social norms and things like that, which was a bit newer hadn't been considered as much in, in the academic, at least behavioral economics literature. Uh, obviously, in other fields, they were thinking about that a lot, but, but hadn't been brought together as well. And the WDR, again, wasn't the only one to do this, but they, they really highlighted that and make a big point of it. So, so I do think that's one thing of just thinking about the social context and network effects and role models, all of those kinds of things, which is, you know, it's been out there, it's in the ether now, but, but I think there's a lot to be explored still and to think about the interactions of that with the individual decision-making processes and group decision-making and family and household decision-making and within organizations decision-making. Again, obviously people have been thinking about organizational decision-making for a long time, but, but the connections with some of the behavioral science, I think, are still, still playing out, and that's exciting. The other one at a, at a very personal level that, that I would like to do, and this, this might, be, might be radical even by behavioral economic standards, is is get into a little bit more normative work and, and obviously relates to social policy and we wouldn't be going around telling people what to do or what to write. But I think economists have been too hesitant to even get into that debate. So normative economics means if, here, if this is your utility function or your profit function from a firm or your social welfare function for a government, what should you do? As opposed to what do people actually do? which is descriptive, the normative is what should you do given a utility function? But I want to sort of step back even further and say, well, are there good and bad utility functions? Are there some that seem to work better than others? I have a, I have a four-year-old son, so I think about that. Like, what if I can mold his utility function, which way would I push it? What do I think is, is going to be most valuable? What's, what's, what, how can I identify a mistake from the outside rather than just through revealed preference or something like that? And, and I think we have tools from economics along with psychology and evolutionary theory and philosophy uh, where, where we can you know, start talking about some of this. And, and that's really, really uh, kind of taboo. So, so it makes it fun, but also means I think there's probably a lot of low-hanging fruit. Yeah, well, that is um, that, that that it sounds exciting, and it I will say is maybe less um, uh, less out there than what I thought you were going to say, which was bloodletting based on your. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, they didn't do it. We should back. just we should just get together and run the study, and then we'll know right. whether we should do bloodletting or not. So yeah, um, we'll just just find the IRB to to approve that, and and we'll go from there. Yeah, and then we'll have the next action design event. We're always trying to push into new areas with action design, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you want, if you want attention, I think this would be, you know, right. free PR. Yeah, any any yeah. PR is good PR, right? So. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So yeah, we're about time here. Um, I think before we wrap up, um, is there anywhere you know where should people follow your work or learn more about what you're doing um, or things like that? Yeah, so the, the, the website of our team is a good place to start. It has, um, has some of my papers and others. I suppose uh, Google Scholar from academic papers. I did have a, I did have a blog, which, I, which I've been meaning to, to resurrect. This might be a good excuse to, to get, back, get back into that. Um, so, yeah, I would just say, say you know, follow along and, and see, what, see what's out there. Cool. Well, this can be a, maybe an impetus for you to start writing things down even more. Yeah, no, it's good because I, I write them down on scraps of paper, but that doesn't do anybody much good. So, so maybe I can, yeah, get <laughs> a little get one step further. With, uh, <laughs> I uh, so I also have been trying to do this, like write down things more uh, as like reminders for myself or notes or just like little thoughts. And so I have a notebook um, from work that I use. And I was sitting at lunch yesterday, and I took this notebook out to start making some notes. And there's a woman sitting at the table next to me, and she starts laughing. And she's like, oh, 
a notebook like a little child. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was a really funny reaction. I guess maybe she thought I should have a computer or something. But she's like, oh, I, I, I wasn't having like a connection in my paper. mind of like notebook to child. But <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm not. I know there have been these studies showing people learn better if they take handwritten notes and. I haven't looked at the rigor of those too much, so this may be a little bit of, of my bias and you know, wanting to hear what you want to hear, but it seems very plausible to me, and obviously a lot of advantages of, of digital things, and we shouldn't move away from that, but it seems very plausible to me that some things just work better if, you, if you're forced to write them out. When I was teaching, you know, I wouldn't give people the slides in advance because I think if you have to write it down, then you have to think a little bit about what's being said and put it in a little bit in your own terms, and that's probably kind of an important step. Probably. Yeah, I would definitely agree. And I think the other benefit of kind of having a notebook writing stuff down is like there's no distraction to it. Um, like when I go to meetings, unless, right. uh, when I go to meetings, unless I really need my computer, I try to not bring my computer and just bring a notebook because otherwise like it's 100% guaranteed I'll start drifting off and checking my email or doing something with a, rather than pay attention because it's just impossible to resist that temptation that's on there. Um, so part, part of, I think, you know, there's, there is absolutely a benefit of like writing things out, but also like there's no other temptations, like there's listening and your notebook and there's nothing else to distract you, you know? Um, I will say, sorry, one last thing on, I, on conference calls, you know, I will often have the computer open because often, you know, I can check my email and do other things and, but I put my computer away for this call. So <laughs> well, yeah. we're, we're, very, we're very honored. We're honored. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I don't really have a way to record on Skype without a computer, but I closed everything else out, so I wasn't really... really <laughs> did the best I could. All right. Well, Julian, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us uh, and for spreading the good word from the World Bank team to all the action designers out there. Yeah, well, I hope everyone everyone uh, checks it out. It's, it's been a lot of fun, interesting, and it's been great to chat. Definitely. Yeah, thanks for taking time. Looking forward to getting this out. And uh, yeah, looking forward to see what uh, what you all do next. Yeah, yeah. We have we have ideas. It'll be fun. Keep track. <laughs> As we can see. <laughs> awesome. All right. All right. See you on thanks. the next podcast, Action Designers. <laughs> <laughs> Where will Rock be next time? <laughs> Tune in to find out. <laughs> Thank you for listening. That concludes this edition of Action Design Radio, hosted by Eric Johnson and Zarak Khan. All podcast episodes are available for download on SoundCloud, YouTube, and iTunes. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Special thanks to Morgan Bortz for design. And as always, we would like to recognize Steve Wendell, founder of the Action Design Network. I am your producer and audio engineer, Zach Simon. For more cutting-edge behavioral science content, visit action-design.org. Once more, that is action-design.org. There, you can sign up for our newsletter and find an in-person event happening near you. We have chapters in over a dozen cities in the United States, plus Toronto. Also on our website, you can find additional notes and links regarding the topics discussed in today's episode. Once again, thank you for tuning in, and we will see you again soon.